Hi, everyone. I, uh, <laughs> thank you. I, I wanted to, uh, I think I'm supposed to give this live announcement that we are in great, great need of translators. So uh, how many of you speak English and Spanish? Okay, you are a candidate. She's like, <laughs> you are a candidate. <laughs> it's going to be a great journey, I promise. Uh, you're a candidate. So we, we would ask you, would you pray about, uh, pray about it and then just do it? You know what I'm saying? Because um, it's a great need. And so you can do it. Do it. You know? And so I was, gonna, I was asked to translate this into Spanish, but if I say this in Spanish, then why are we asking you to be a translator? Because more than likely you don't speak English if you need to hear it in Spanish. Did I blow someone's mind? I really, we really, really need everybody. If you, if you do have this gift, uh, it, it, it is a great gift. Um, I, I translate better from, from English, uh, I'm sorry, from Spanish to English. I don't translate well from, from English to Spanish. And so, uh, but I've done that. I've had a great time doing it, actually. And so, uh, if you've never done it before, we'll train you. Uh, we'll take care of you. We're not throwing you out into the deep end. Although, when I started ministry, I was kind of thrown out into the deep end. So... Uh, sometimes that happens, but we're not going to do that to you, I promise. Um, we're going to uh, take a little journey quickly, and um, I just want to share with you all a little bit of my experience. Um, my, my family, I think I've shared this before, but my family comes from Cuba, and um, this is 4th of July weekend, and um, this was a particularly important weekend for my family, for my grandfather particularly. Um, because he was what I consider the patriarch of my family. He was my hero. I had the privilege of, of leading him to the Lord right before he passed away. Um, this, was, uh, this was two years ago in September. September 25th will, will be two years. I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord, but he led our family to a great country. I remember, I remember my grandfather... I sat down and I recorded about 30 minutes of footage with them because I always wanted to keep that. I wanted to keep that as, a, uh, uh, as a, just a precious, a precious time where I could hear his voice again. I could see his, his facial expressions. I could, I could hear the passion in his voice. And he was not a sympathizer uh, of the regime in Cuba whatsoever. Uh, he told some funny stories, and he told some really heart-wrenching stories of some of the stuff that took place when he was there. One of the stories that I will never forget, I heard this from my father. I didn't hear it from my grandfather himself, although I referenced it later uh, it, when I sat down with my grandfather at this 30-minute session. And uh, I, I, my father began to tell the story. He said, when I was a child, the, the communist regime came in to and took over, obviously, uh, all of Cuba. And they, they started in the schools. They started in, in primary schools to, uh, to teach children and to indoctrinate children. And um, they told you who to worship. They told you where to worship. They told you who, where to walk, how to walk, what jobs you're going to do, what jobs you're not going to do. They took all of these people that had the freedom of God, God-given freedom to choose the profession of their, uh, of, of their careers, to choose the profession of their lives. Some were doctors, some were electricians, some were nurses, some were uh, what, whatever, car mechanics. And they demoralized them so much that they took them into the cane fields and they said, this is where you're going to work from now on. So, so demoralizing, so in tra training them, training them to the regime, letting them know you're no longer, you're no longer in, in, in control of yourselves. You, you are doing what we're going to tell you, what you're going to do, what we tell you to do. This is firsthand information coming from my grandfather who lived that life. He saw the takeover from Batista to Castro. And uh, he said... It was such a tragedy, a land that had been so beautiful, a land, he said, Johnny, there would be pastures and just the, the beauty of, of, of the, of, of the uh, uh, bosques uh, in, in English, of forests and uh, these, these, little, these little villages that were just, 
uh, charming, beautiful uh, areas that had completely just been decimated by the regime and completely turned over into this machine that was never intended. He said they took, uh, they, they started with the children and they began to indoctrinate the children. And he said, uh, they made us wear, this is my father speaking, they made us wear these uniforms before they, 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 would, they would be as free as, as they could wear whatever they want. But now it was a uniform that they had, to, they had to wear. I remember my father saying that he went home one, uh, one weekend and they would live, they, uh, the, the, the story goes, or what I had heard him told, uh, the, 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 the thought was, they would, they would spend the week in schools and on the weekends they would allow the children to go to their homes and spend time with their families. Well, one Sunday, or one, one, one weekend rather, my, my, my father came home in his uniform and my, my grandfather, who was not a sympathizer with the regime, looked at him and he said, Juan Manuel, si papa, si people. He called, he called my grandfather people. And he said, what are you doing wearing that uniform? He says, this is the uniform that they make us wear. He said, take that uniform off. And he said, you will not be returning to school with your uniform. Well... I mean, imagine, you know, you've got probably, I don't know what dad was. It was probably eight at the time. He's got to go back and face the, <laughs> he's got to go back and face the, uh, the, uh, his people, right? He's got to face the, the, the crew of the, or the, the, the teachers of the school. And uh, so he shows up on Monday morning and he says, Juan Manuel, and they say, Juan Manuel, <laughs> si maestro, uh, why aren't you wearing your uniform? He said, um, he said, I'm, my, my father, when I went home, told me that I was not allowed to wear this back into school. I don't know really what happened after that. I didn't have the thought to ask him, what did you do? You know, did, they, did you ever get back to, to wearing your uniform? I didn't even have the scruples to, to ask that. The, the, point, the point of the story is that it so impacted my father and it so impacted him, the stand that my grandfather took for his family, that he would uproot his family and he would move them to this land. This land represented freedom. This land represented to them a new hope. We can argue with this all day long. Is our country perfect? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There have been some atrocities in our, in, our, in our history. We've learned. I believe we've learned from them. I'm still learning from them. But I, stay, I say this. It so impacted my grandfather and it impacted me thinking there are people that fight for freedom. And there was a great salvation that was purchased for you. Jesus purchased your salvation. He fought hell and he fought the grave for you. Everything that that encompasses, every single thing that that encompasses, he won the victory for you. Victory over lust, victory over anger, victory over unforgiveness, victory over fear and all that it encompasses and all of its tentacles and all of the places that it reaches inside of your life. Even those things he won for you. I find myself oftentimes looking at my life and I start thinking then if this is such a great a salvation that was purchased, why do I still allow myself? Why do I still allow myself to do or to leave these certain things in my life unchecked. It might be anger. It might be lust. It might be, it might be unforgiveness. Isn't it amazing that oftentimes we can forgive other people, but it's a difficult thing. There's a self-hatred that happens to you because you can't seem to forgive and get over this place in your life where God has 
paid everything. And if he doesn't hold things against you, then why do you hold things against you? Now, when I say that, I know that there are people in the congregation that say this is kind of rhetoric. Maybe it's rhetoric, but it's extremely true. Think in your life. Some of the things that have happened in your life, shameful situations, shameful things that you look at your life and say, this is what I did. This is what I did. A lot of us have probably buried those things as defense mechanisms. But somewhere in the room of your life, there's still a tree that's growing. There's still a weed that's growing. There's still something in the corner that still needs to be dealt with. There's those things in your life and there's those things in my life. But the great news this morning is that Jesus purchased all of that. There was a great sacrifice that could only come from the Father. The revelation, new t- the, new, the New Testament is the, re- is the revelation of the Father. The New Testament is the revelation of how deeply He cares. The, 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 new, the new Testament is is Jesus pointing at all times towards the Father, reference after reference, calling on the character of the Father, who He is, what He's done. It was His plan. It was His plan hatched from the foundations of the world to free you. That is the goodness of the Father. That is the goodness of the Father. There's some of you this morning that can relate to Jesus all day long. But there's something inside of you that blocks you. There's something inside of you that blocks you from receiving the great forgiveness and the plan. It was his plan to bring redemption, to strike his only son. Woo! To strike his only son so that you can have complete and total healing through one substance, and it's the blood of Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Two weeks ago, thank you so much, Sergio, I appreciate that. Two weeks ago, I, I, um, we came out of a meeting, out of an elders meeting, I know I don't look that old. Why'd you laugh? That's not even funny. (laughs) We came out of an elders meeting and I was walking, I was pacing in my kitchen, which I often like to do. I'm a pacer. Uh, When I talk on the phone, I'm a pacer. I'm very loud when I talk on the phone. And and, uh, (laughs) have you ever seen that meme that says, no, I'm not angry. No, I'm not. When when Cubans talk, it's like super, super loud. And oftentimes, you know, other family members, white white family members would think, why are they so angry? Oh, no, they're not angry. They're just just talking. (laughs) And so I'm pacing in my, I'm pacing in my, uh, in my, in my, um, my kitchen, and, um, and, I, and I had this thought, and I want to give honor to our pastor this morning, because he has fought one hell of a fight. Am I allowed to say that in church? I think in this context, he has fought extremely hard. There are times that we sit in his office, and the stances that he took during the times of COVID, the stances that he took um, at, at different times. And he said, Johnny, if we give in now, what will become of the church of the future? <laughs> I, I got to be honest with you, I didn't always agree. <laughs> but <laughs> from what I've seen, the man was right. Amen. And I've seen him every week fight against hell. The hell that comes against his mind. We've sat and had very candid conversations. The spiritual warfare that happens when you come up to this pulpit and you're preparing, you're preparing a message for this pulpit. You know what I'm talking about. 
and the stuff that he goes through on a week, week in and week, and week out. Is that the way they say that? And, uh, and, and, I, and, and the, the messages this past year alone that he has dug in and he has pulled out the revelation that has come out. How many of you are here for the, for the, for the book of Revelation series? Yeah, come on, Jesus. If you haven't gotten that, make sure to grab that. It's incredible revelation. The stuff that he has pulled out, it's for a purpose. It's for a reason. I believe that we are living in the grandest days to date. I believe that we're going to see the glory of God tangible. I believe we're going to feel it, and I believe you're going to see it, and I believe that you're going to see miracles more than ever. I believe that God is going to reveal himself in ways that are just like things of, of wow, storybook stuff. I believe the stances that we've taken, I believe that God is going to reward and God is going to bless. I believe there's going to come greater revelation. Come on, yeah, I dig that. I believe that there's going to come greater revelation in these days to come. There is coming a fight. But it's not something that should scare you. You have been purchased. You are, you are an absolute vessel. You listen for the Holy Spirit. When Holy Spirit wants your attention, he's going to get it. And, and this I'll say also, in those moments... When the scripture says, care not what you're going to say. I believe that the grace of God is going to come upon individuals to be able to stand and make stands and be examples. You have been given such a salvation. It is not for naught. It is not in vain. God is going to release something on the earth. And I was sitting in my kitchen, back to my story, because I love to do these rabbit trails. I don't do them on purpose. I'm sorry. So I was, sitting, I was standing in my kitchen, pacing in my kitchen, and I heard the Lord say this. Fernando is in a place where John Kilpatrick was that many years ago before 1995 Father's Day when the release of the Holy Spirit came upon a small church, an Assembly of God church at that, in Pensacola, Florida where God released his presence, released his power. It was such a phenomenon that people came from all over the world to find out what was happening in a small church in Pensacola, Florida. I don't look to those days as beautiful as they were, as amazing as they were. I don't look to those days and thinking, God, if we were only back there, I don't want to be back there. If some of you that lived through that stuff, you know what I'm talking about. Look, God's graduating us into another place. We know a lot more than what we did before. And we'll act hopefully a lot different. Not downing what happened there. It was a phenomenon and it was amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. But the Lord said there's coming a day where the Spirit of God is going to be poured out. Fernando is in that place. There was a time where John Kilpatrick went to the West Florida District of the Assemblies of God and he says, I need you to get me out of Brownsville. This is, a, this is on Songs and Stories. He told, this, he told this story. How many of you heard the Brownsville Revival? Okay, how many of you have not heard of the Brownsville Revival? It's okay, raise your hand. I'm not going to throw anything at you. Okay, you can find this on YouTube. Don't be scared. <laughs> You can find it on YouTube to just kind of get a little bit of a, a, of a kind of a, a, a motion of, of what was happening. And, and let me just say, uh, when we watched videos, when we watched videos, we could still feel the presence of God. And some of the stuff that was happening, some I didn't understand. I'll be honest with you, I didn't. I remember when I went to Brownsville, I stood up in the balcony for two weeks just trying to, I don't, I don't know if it was two weeks or two months, it kind of went by. But I, I would stand just kind of watching people get prayed for and fall out under the power of God and really get touched by the presence of God. God, for those days where we see the power of God flowing through individuals, and it's not just people at pulpits. It's not people at pulpits. It's people in congregations. It's people that will dare to believe and choose to believe for more. Come on. 
There's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. Am I doing okay? So he had said to the Brown, so he had said to the West Florida district, I need you to move me. I need you to move me out of, out of Pensacola. I need you to find me another place. Brief time later, a brief time later, an evangelist came on Father's Day of 1995. John Kilpatrick was checked out, ready to go home, ready to go home and enjoy his Father's Day with his family. The preacher was going along, and he said, do you remember this story, Sherry? Have you heard this? <laughs> so he said, uh, he said, the preacher was, Steve was just going long. And I was just saying, just shut up. Come on, man. We got to, let's let the people go. It's Father's Day. Let them enjoy the time with their families and whatnot. <laughs> he said, something happened in that church on Father's Day of 1995 where the Spirit of God just came in. <laughs> and he said, he said, I turned to my wife and he said, baby, I just wish, you know, we, you know, it's Father's Day. We need you know, we need to get going. And uh, his wife looked at him and he said, she had a name for him. I don't remember what the name was, but she said, you can go if you want to, but I'm not leaving. <laughs> After that, the spirit of God broke out in revival, changed, changed the lives of many people that entered those doors. I'm a product of that. And I felt the Lord say, Going back to it. I felt the Lord say that there's going to come a time where the Spirit of God under your leadership, Fernando, is going to be poured out over this church. Poured out over this church. And it's not going to look like it looked before. It's not going to look like it looked before. It's not going to be contained inside of one church. It's going to blow up. And it's going to move in this city. When I came to Houston, Texas, 21 years ago, I saw, I saw a stage in the center of the city. It's a blue stage, so if it ever happens, we need to get blue carpet, okay? <laughs> There's a blue stage in the center of the city, and there was a sea of people, and they were worshiping under one banner, one Jesus. Not a, not a church. Not a church. There's going to come a revival. And I hate saying revival because revival holds its negative connotations. But whatever you want to call it, whether you want to call it an awakening or you want to call it revival or you want to call it renewal or whatever you want to say, there's going to come a great, great move of God. Let's call it that. So while you have these, let's turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. When Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Or better said, Repent, because I've brought my kingdom. It's time that we start getting to the point that repentance of sins, repentance doesn't just get us out of, doesn't just get us to forgiveness, but repentance brings us to a place of kingdom. Repentance so much, let me say that again, because I said it better, I, I wrote it better. <laughs> Most Christians repent enough to be forgiven but not enough to see the kingdom and get a different view. Say it again. Say it again. 
Most Christians repent enough to be forgiven, but not enough to see the kingdom and get a different view. Years ago, I remember that Jack Taylor came to our services. And um, one of the things was he brought the message of the kingdom. And one of the things that he would always say is that a lot of Christians, they, they, are, they are in the kingdom, live in the kingdom, but don't enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. What are the benefits of the kingdom? I think it's peace, yeah. What's another benefit of the kingdom? Say again loud. Healing. What else? Say. One at a time. Say one. Joy. Freedom. Mercy. Abundance. Oh, come on. Peace and joy. Sleep. Rest. Dude, sleep is something I haven't seen in quite some time. That's good. These are the benefits of the kingdom. Another benefit of the kingdom is praying heaven to earth. You are called. You are you are to govern. You are to proclaim. You don't go to the Father. That's good. And tell Him to proclaim. Ask Him to proclaim. Plead for Him to proclaim. You have been given that right. You have been given that authority. One of the things that Bill Johnson says, and I thought was so good. Let me read this because it's too good. I'll mess it up. He says, how long will you keep your jobs if you keep going to your boss asking him to fix what he's already given you the authority to do? <laughs> Not very long. I would learn that pretty quick. I remember going to Fernando many, many times when I didn't really give, I, didn't, I really didn't, I really didn't um, quite honestly, walk in the authority that he had given me. And, he sa- and I would go and, and, and I would say, you know, Fernando, you know, such and such is happening and this is happening. And he says, Why? And I said, well, you don't understand. It's this. And he said to me, you know what your problem is? <laughs> and he didn't say it like this. He was nice. He was great. He was teacher, teacher. But he said, you don't believe in the authority that I've given you. And if you don't believe in the authority that I've given you, they're not going to believe in the authority that I've given you. I don't say that to puff myself up. I, it, took me a while to, it took me a while to learn that. You said that to me quite a bit. It took me a while to learn that. But God has given you that right. And God has given you that authority. If we're still praying from, heaven, or from, from earth to heaven, we're missing something. Why aren't we praying from heaven to earth with a mindset of heaven to earth and proclaiming things from heaven to earth Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think I will. God has given you that ability. God has given you that authority. Church, let's start walking in it. What is the one thing that you look at your life and you say, God, if I get rid of this, it's going to propel me. Into, into your destiny. It's going to propel me into destiny. It'll give me, it'll give me the freedom that I need. What's the one thing? Think about it. Holy Spirit, right now, Lord, drop it into their lives. What is it, Holy Spirit? What is it, Holy Spirit? A lot of us, what we've done is we take these little things and, and these little bondages, these bondages in our lives, and we, we kind of care for them. It's the plant, it's the weed in the room. It's kind of like, like a baby alligator. <laughs> right? You take a little baby alligator and you're just nurturing it and you're loving it and, 
you know, occasionally you give it a little kiss on the top of the head, you know, you're feeding it. It's going to get bigger and it's going to get bigger and it's going to get bigger. And remember, this is a cold blooded animal. Okay. This isn't like Fido. This isn't like your Rover. This isn't like, so you've got a cold blooded killer animal inside of your room. You're nurturing. One day you fall asleep. <laughs> Someone said breakfast. One day you fall asleep and this thing, at one point in your life, overtakes you. These are the little things that we allow to stay in our lives that God is intending for you to face. There was a time in my life where I was in so much debt, at least in my eyes. I was in a lot of, there have been people that have been in much more than this, but they took greater risks. But I was in so much debt, I avoided looking at my bank statements. I avoided looking at, I avoided looking at my spending. Come on, Jesus, how many of you can relate to me this morning? Can you relate to me? Thank you for being honest. And I would completely ignore it. And I'd say, well, you know, if they give us like a, uh, if, I, if I work an extra job or if I get a, a bonus or if I, you know, and, and I had great faith to believe. I really did, which was kind of crazy, but I had great faith to believe for finance. I really did. But I was terrible. We were terrible at confrontation. And before we knew it, we'd run up so much debt. There was a day we were just tired of it. My wife and I sat down and we said, we're going to do this. It's going to hurt. <laughs> we're probably going to have to cut off some appendages here. It's not going to feel good. But at the end, it's going to be beautiful. We faced that fear. We looked through our finances. And to be honest with you, it wasn't really as bad as we thought. In the end, they'll say, is this the one? Is this the one that made the nations tremble? Is this the one? God's calling you to start making some confrontations. It's not going to feel good. It's, 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 it's um, intimidating. It's intimidating to do so. God wants you free. When we decided to make that confrontation, when we came against the spirit of fear... When we came against the spirit of fear, we eliminated over $20,000 of debt in 14 months. I'm saying there's going to be a confrontation and it needs to happen. There's some things that we've allowed in our rooms and in our houses that we've allowed to grow up and it really shouldn't be there. You think that you're walking in freedom and you're not. You, you've learned to coddle this thing and you've taken it on as a personality. Well, that's just the way that I am. And if they don't like it, well, you know. You've taken it as a character trait. And God is saying to you, no, that's not a character trait. That's bondage. That's bondage. And it's time to confront that and start getting rid of it. I didn't come for that. I came for something greater than that. I came to give you something much, much greater than that. I came to give you freedom. It is for freedom that he has set us free, Galatians 5.1. It is for the sake of freedom that he has set you free. What's the one thing? What's the one thing that if you made the decision to go forward would catapult you into your future? Craig Rochelle. What is that hard decision? What is that, what is that intimidating decision that you need to make? I'm still trying to answer that question. I, I, asked, I, I heard the question about six weeks ago. In every generation, God exposes us to a phenom. In every generation, there's a man or there's a woman that is like you look at them and you say, my goodness, 
that person can sing like no, like no one can. That person can hit notes that are just like things of fairy tale. Or that person can play ball like no one can. Now, there are some people, when I, when I mention this name, that are going to rebut and not say, you know, well, not really. But one of the greatest basketball players, if not the greatest basketball player of our time, and all the guys' ears perk up, Michael Jordan. Before Michael Jordan, there was no one that would jump. Pretend this is, a, this is the, uh, the foul line. There was no one that would jump from a foul line, take flight, (laughs) remember tongue hanging out, and slam from the foul line. If there was someone that was, don't mess up my story. Look at this. From the foul line. There were coaches that would be in stupors after, after facing him, his opponent. Uh, they're, they're, the, the opposing team, there would be coaches that would be in a stupor after facing him, unbelieving of the things that they just saw on the court. Times where they, they were known to be the team to beat. But there was a time, and there was a time that was going to change. Take a listen to this. Floor. When he was in the air, we, we had no shot. Uh, but, you know, when everything was on the floor, you can hold your own. You have to stop him before he takes flight. Because, you know, he's not human. Here again, the implementation of the Jordan rule. There was a time where they could not take the Pistons. He tried and tried for years until one season. The coach was in a complete stupor. There was a time when when he had the flu game. Does anybody remember the flu game? It was 103 degree temperature. He had 103 degree temperature. And he played one of the greatest games, legendary games of his life. In a press conference, they said to the opposing team's coach, does anybody, do you remember who that is, Carl? What the flu game was? I thought you would know. Carl's my, my guru. But um, they, they, they said, said, coach, did you know that, that Michael was sick? And he said, he was sick? <laughs> he was kind of in a stupor. But then he woke up to the question. He said he was sick? Because the game I just saw... I would have never thought that the guy had 103 degree temperature. That's news to me. His name was Phil something. Okay. So, did you hear what they said? They had what was called Jordan rules. So, to combat him, there was a set of rules that were made especially, specifically for Michael Jordan. You had to keep him on the ground. Because if there was a time that he took flight, it was over. It was over. What is it? When the enemy confers... When they confer with one another regarding your life, what what is the game plan? What is it in your life that say that they say if we can just get this on him, if we can just get this on her, we've got them. What are your Jordan rules? What are your Jordan rules? I propose this. God shows us these phenoms in our lives to show you that there is absolutely nothing that is impossible. 
Before Michael Jordan, no one jumped from the free throw line and made a dunk. From the free throw line, it was a glide, a, a thing of beauty to watch him dunk. After Michael Jordan, it became the norm. His ceiling became their floor. What is it that you'll come out and say, this person's impossibilities are not going to be my impossibilities? God's got incredible things for you. He's calling us to begin to pray from heaven to earth and to declare from heaven to earth. There is a great, great time coming. I preached this message some time ago on the signs of fear. And I think it's worth mentioning. I think it's worth mentioning for this moment. Because I believe that this is one of the greatest monsters that you face is fear. Because it has so many tentacles. And it has, there's so many signs of it. And these are just a few. Number one, let's tackle this today. Striving for perfection. When you're afraid of criticism, failure, and rejection, you strive for perfection. Number two, you settle for less. When you fear, you stop dreaming. Settling is a devastating symptom of fear. You have a problem saying no for fear of disappointing or being rejected. It doesn't mean that it's wrong to say yes always. It just has to be done with love-based motivation rather than fear. You have a problem saying yes. You're afraid to take risks, so you say no to great opportunities. One of the things that I told my I told my children years ago is I was like, look, don't let fear determine your future. There were many times in my life that I was faced with great challenge. I was asked to for great (laughs) great opportunities. I wanted with everything within me to shrink back. Back in Brownsville, I was asked to audition. I came up with the righteous thing. I'm not going to perform. I'm I'm a worshiper. I'm not a performer. And the Lord told me, I want you to go. I was afraid. There was one time that they came to me here, and and Pastor Gabi got us this opportunity to to lead worship in uh, in Reliant Arena for one of the prayer. uh, it It was a prayer. It was a nationwide kind of a prayer thing with IHOP and everything. I came this close to saying, I can't really do that. I can't. What a great opportunity. What a great opportunity. Don't allow the things that seem so intimidating to stop you from great, great opportunities. You're worth much more than that. You use food, alcohol, technology, or you throw yourself into work to distract yourself. Number six, you procrastinate. A fear of failure, success, uncertainty, judgment, criticism, rejection keeps you from tackling things head on. Number seven, you struggle with decisions. You avoid leaving toxic relationships. You won't set boundaries with people you need to set boundaries with. You stay in a job that you hate. Sometimes God calls us to to those moments to fight through some things and to build some things in us, some tenacity. I get that. But by and large, you stay in a place because it's something you feel safe. You are a control freak. How many of you can relate to that? I won't ask you to raise your hand. (laughs) When you're afraid, you micromanage the heck out of everything. It kills the creative environment and squashes gifts in others. You don't speak up. Shyness is often fear disguised. Lastly, some of us become ill. God wants you free. He so wants you free. Whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's hatred because of hatred towards something that was done to you, Maybe unforgiveness towards yourself. You haven't let go of something that you feel so shameful of. There's a woman here that you had an abortion and you haven't been able to forgive yourself. Maybe you're watching. I don't know if it's here in the in the in the audience or or but you haven't been able to forgive yourself. 
It's time to let it go. God's forgiven you. He's released that. He loves you. Don't let that stuff of the past stop you from your futures. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's lust. Let's start letting go. Let's stand together. Let's take a moment. Let's make this a point of confrontation. Confrontation's good. It's good. Holy Spirit, bow your heads. Holy Spirit, right now, would you speak? It's for the sake of freedom that he set you free. It's for the sake of freedom that he has set you free. Would you speak right now that thing, Lord God, as you lovingly do through your Holy Spirit? Speak, Father, the things that we're now to confront and release. Those things, Lord God, that we've accepted of ourselves, thinking that this is just a limitation of mine, or this is just a, this is just a, it's just a character flaw. It's part of my personality. Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you shine your light on those moments? Would you shine your light on those moments? Holy Spirit, you're so faithful. You're so faithful. I speak right now in the name of Jesus that God would bring a revelation to you of your freedom. Would, can we pray together, Lord, in the name of Jesus? You can say this under your breath after we say this. You don't have to be afraid. In the name of Jesus, I renounce, and then you can say what it is, this situation or this thing in my life. I repent of it right now in the name of Jesus. You have shown your light on it. Lord, I want it out of my life. It has plagued me. I've been deceived by it. And I don't want to live with this anymore. I choose freedom. Say it again. I choose freedom. I choose freedom. Father, I pray that you would move in this place. Touch, Father. As we leave here, we're convinced and we're talked to by the enemy saying, that was a little bit, you know, intense, wasn't it? <laughs> Are we justify? Lord, shut the voice of the enemy. Shut the voice of the enemy. We believe your word. It was a great salvation and a great price that you paid. We love you. We bless you. The name of Jesus praise. And Father, our prayer is that you would use us speaking, praying from heaven to earth, believing from heaven to earth, to release from heaven to earth in all of our situations, in all of our influences, Father, in the name of Jesus, in all, Lord God, our respective places, whether it's in our homes or our workplaces, we believe that the glory of God will touch every part of our lives. We believe that the glory of God would touch every piece of us, Lord God, would reach out, Father, beyond our influence and touch lives. We bless you, we love you, and believe, God, that you have called us to be set apart to, Lord, Father, touch this generation with the glory of God. Show them the love of God. Show them the mercy of God. Show them the freedom of God. Show them that it's time. It's time, Father, for the glory of God to be manifest in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <laughs> Church, we love you so much. I want to ask all of our prayer partners to come up forward. Uh, please, our altar ministers, if you need... If you, need some, if you need some independence this morning, you need someone that you need to lock arms with, that you need want to believe with you for a certain thing that you're believing for, or that you're trying to fight against, they're here and they're wonderful, wonderful people. They will keep, uh, they will keep uh, confidentiality. They're uh, amazing individuals with great integrity. Church, we love you. Remember Wednesday night, we're having prayer and worship. There are few churches anymore that are praying together. There are few churches that are praying together. Come, come.
Let's worship together. Let's pray together on Wednesday night. This this month we're going to be a it's a special in, uh, um, it's a special uh, influence of prayer. That's not the right word. We're we're going to be we're going to be highlighting prayer. We want to pray. We want to believe God to do amazing things. Church, we love you. We'll see you on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. We'll see you next uh, next Sunday, 9 a.m. and 10:45. Have an amazing, amazing day. Bless you.